in my mind, this is the cornerstone of everything, is to understand what it is that we mean when we say that the game is the teacher. And um, some people like saying the game is not really the teacher, the teacher is the teacher and the game is the learning environment. And that's fine, but it's just an expression. It's just a cliche to say it like this. But what really matters to me is to say, we have to understand that it is in the complexity of the game where skills and creativity arise, not in isolated mechanized situations. It means, I always give the same example because to me it's the easiest, the easiest example. What is the point? Dribbling might be, might be the most important technical skill. Um, a lot of people like Bielsa, they say dribbling is my favorite skill because it solves every problem. Like nowadays, there's, it's almost like a fashion to talk so much about numbers. There's a 2v1 here, there's a 3v1 there, there's a 1v2 there. The problem is dribbling solves them all, right? So if we want, and there's a, there's a trend for dribblers to be the most expensive players in the world, actually, because they fear every problem. So if we know that drilling is so important and we try to understand the nature of drilling and we look at the best drillers in the world, how did they learn to drill? And truth is they learned on the street because you can't teach it. There's no way to teach drilling. So <clears throat> the world goes, in my opinion right now, and there's a decline in street soccer. So at the end, my question is like, how can we actually create more of those environments. And this is what this phrase is really about, to say it's not an isolated, a mechanized situation. I Sometimes we see coaches and we see sessions that spend so much time in saying like, hey, this is how you do a scissors move. This is how you do, and they spend 30 minutes doing that. And truth is, I've never seen Messi do one scissors move. And he can dribble six players in a row. I've never seen Maradona do one scissors move. And even more, if we think about players that actually do it, like Neymar, I can tell you, nobody ever told Neymar how to do it. He just learned. So that's why to me, this, this very phrase, um, it's so important. And I think it's the cornerstone of the discussion. But I would like to hear, um, and sometimes sharing screen can be complicated because I can't really see you. Um, but I would like to open a little bit of, co of a conversation and a debate there and see what you guys think as well. If anybody wants to go, please, by the way, interrupt, unmute yourselves and, and let's make it a conversation. Yeah, this is Tim. Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yeah, you are. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with the statement. I think we need to play a lot. I think, I think there's just a, a big need that, and there's a lot of data and s stats that when you just play a game, or as close to a game as possible, whether it's 5v5 on the streets or close to as goal as possible. doesn't have to be a perfect net. Four by eight could be two sticks. The closest you get to the game, I think, is very important. And I think, I, I think we don't do enough of it. I think coaches almost interfere with players' development because they got to do drills and possibly could teach bad habits. You know, we, we take a shot on goal. And this just comes to my mind. I, you know, I don't have this pre-planned speech. We take it, we, we get in a line, we take a shot on goal, and then we get to the end of the line. The kid knows he gets to shoot again. There's no urgency in his shot. There's no competition. But I still do shooting drills, right? I do, there, there's pros and cons to it. But is that close to the game? You know, is, is, is the kid shooting off balance? Is, is it zero, zero with three minutes left? Is it pressure there? You know, so... I'm a big fan of the game. I look at look what bad habits I'm teaching the what the shooter. There's no transition. He shoots and walks back to the end of the line. Typically, if you shoot, you'd follow up or transition to defense. Now I'm not saying shooting's a bad drill. I do it all the time. But am I teaching bad habits? How about box on box? Megan, I did it last night for 45 minutes. Box on box? Am I in the defensive third or am I in the attacking third? You know, it's a good game, Tim, but did I, what, what habits am I teaching? Hey, don't dribble in the back third. Coach, I'm in the attacking third. I'm playing box on box. Sometimes our drills, it. sometimes our, my point is, and I'll keep quiet for a little while. Sometimes our exercises 
create bad habits. They do, and sometimes they limit development. I, and I believe in that. That's why a lot of important people that we know, and when we spoke, for example, to Ruben Rossi like two weeks ago, he was saying, I don't even like calling myself um, coach. I call myself helper. I call myself facilitator because the game is really who's teaching. And, and we were talking about this really interesting example of saying, we all know how important it is to dribble, to go back to dribbling, for example. But then, you know, we have a U8 and we start saying, hey, Peter, but pass it, pass it, pass it. So how is he going to learn like that if you don't let him dribble? And that's why the best dribblers in the world are on the street, because there was nobody, in my opinion, because there was nobody saying, hey, you know what, after you do one drill, but then you got to pass it. Or we try to structure the, the very aspect of dribbling, like it's something that you can mechanize or that you can turn into concepts, and you can't, because you can't teach it. When we start talking about, um, yeah, you make a move or you accelerate or you got to change directions, we're, that's, what's that? There's no... That's not drilling. Drilling is just about deception. That's it. If you, <laughs> I go one v one against you, it doesn't matter if I do it quick or fast or slow. It doesn't matter. I just gotta go past you. So, well, if you look at all the techniques, and I think there's mm -hmm. six of them. Some federation there says there's five, but I like to throw tackling in there. I think I think dribbling is the least black and white. I think heading is black and white. Shooting is black and white. I think trapping is black and white. Um, traffic passing is black and white and even tackling it's very scientific dribbling probably the most difficult thing for me to teach and I agree with you that's probably you just learn it in 5v5 keep away and or whatever 5v5 you know go to goal it, it's probably the most creative now now if I'm shooting do I have to teach a kid from Yugoslavia that's played you know all his life shooting no but in America I think you do I think you have to say here's how you you know here's your instep and here's your plan foot and and here's your follow through. And here's why we shoot it with bend or the three toed like a Brazilian or, you know, a volley or half volley. I think there's science to that. And I think, I think you have to teach the kids here in the United States a little bit more mechanical ways to do it and then go out and do it 10,000 times like the experts say. I, I'm not so sure some of that stuff applies around the world. Like a kid in Brazil, you're going to teach him anything. He, he likes the ball bouncing in the air. We tell our kids to keep it on the ground. He wants to flick it up in the air because he's got more options. Now he can flick it over the guy's head. We tell the kids in our country, switch point of attack because it's crowded. In Mexico, they say, keep it there because it's, it's tinier. Well, there's no right and wrong way. It, it's playing football. And then the coach should step in and here's an option for you. Here's a, here's a choice for you. And you only can do that when it's 11 11. Because I'm a national instructor, Megan. Anytime a coach does a drill, I can critique it. Anytime I can say, oh, you're shooting drill, you should have competition or you should have defending or you should have another player so they have an option to pass or shoot. Well, no, I can keep going up the ladder until I say perfection is 11 v 11. It is perfection. There's no way as an instructor I can critique that. I can be the worst coach in the world, sit on the bench, and if I'm playing 11 v 11, at least I got the bases covered. Now, if I want to be a great coach, I can motivate. I can pull out the details. I can, I can bring on a little bit more. Because the top coaches in the world, no, most of the good coaches in the world, they know the basics, all the, the common denominator stuff, everybody does. Then when the great coaches come out, they know the basics, but they know how to motivate and they know how to player management. There are good coaches, but they're not good player managers and they struggle. Jurgen Klopp, I'm not so sure he knows more than Slobo. I'm not so sure. But I think Jurgen Klopp, knows how to put his hand around somebody, how to interact, how to get the most out of that player. And that, I think that's where the difference, I'm not picking on Slobo, but maybe that's why there's a difference there. We know a lot about football, but the team manager, the manager, they call them around the world, the, the coach, those guys are exceptional people, 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 persons, person, people, people, people pleasers. No, I agree with you. Know, last time somebody was saying, and um, I really like that somebody was saying, the Menotti said once, if you want to be a coach, the first two things that you got to know about are football and footballers. 
he didn't say you need to know about exactly it. you have to start by knowing about football and footballers and he was making a highlight on that you got to know about footballers you got to know how they think you got to be able to em em empathize with, with them and in fact let me ask this audience pablo what's more important your intellect or your player management i hope everybody says player management mm -hmm. all i need to know is a few things about hockey a few things a few things about ice hockey and i'll bet you i'm better than the coaches that are very intellectual and they because I can team motivate and I can tell the kid he's good. And that was a great ball, a great pass you made. I don't know what they call a pass in hockey, but I can tell him he's great and put my hand around and say, yeah, you were the best today. And that kid's going to come back and play more. Now what I'm going to, I'm going to get eventually fooled as I get up the ladder with this hockey team, because they're going to want to know detailed, intricate, technical things that I'm not going to go. But, but on average 18 and below, I could, I bet you I could be a team coach in any sport and know, minimal about the technical tactical aspects and that's where we lack we go to these stupid licenses and i'm an instructor i'm i'm at fault of it we do all these x's and o's and progression and you know um timetables and all this stuff and we miss we miss some of the basics and that's player management and i think we're getting better at it and 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 observe a good coach on why he's good and why that team wants to die for him or her I would, I, would, I would jump in just really briefly and just talk about like the importance of as youth coaches thinking about player management in terms of understanding the development process of young people physically, psychologically, spatially, IQ, um, because obviously at the professional level, most of those are, are adults or, or pretty close to being adults, um, fully formed people in some ways. And so a lot of it's about psychology um, knowing when to put your arm around a player, knowing when to maybe get, be a little bit stern or be strict or be, you know, pretty direct. Um, when to point out mistakes or, or successes like you're talking about. But I think as youth coaches, the, the foundation for me is understanding the learning process, understanding how young people learn, understanding at what age they develop spatial IQ, at what age they develop an ability to sort of work with other people, with how many other people, how, what's their emotional and psychological development based on what we know about one education and two sort of child psychology. Um, you know, I think that's what, in terms of like youth coaching, that's what player management means to me, like really having an intricate understanding of, of those things, because I think that's, that's sort of, like you said, the X's and the O's become secondary if you're a really good educator and you really understand what, what development is from a science perspective. Yep. You know, and, and it's in one word, one of, one of the core values, and I don't like to quote the core values because they get thrown back in your face, is empathy. What does that 12-year-old, why, why are they there? They want, they want to interact with their friends and have fun. You know, okay, empathize with that. Let's go interact with his friends, help him interact. Let's go have some fun. And on the way, let's teach him a little bit of football. If you, if you can empathize with that nine, 10 year old, you know, their, their, tension is, their tension span is short. You know, they've got other things on their mind. They, they can't focus. <coughs> 2D is not a concept to them. You know, 3D is, is big on them, short words. Let them, let them talk about about something different at halftime, you know, how their dog ate their homework or something, let them do it for a little while. He's interacting, he's bonding. That's what we want to do anyway. And then, and then I'll say, okay, it's my turn to talk, fellas, you know, blah, blah, blah. But empathizing, like Megan said, you know, if you use the big words on them, they're lost anyway. But empathize, what does that nine-year-old want? What does an 18-year-old, what does a pro want? They, I'm not so sure some of these pros are different than a nine-year-old. They want to be praised. They want to have fun. Oh, my God. I played 10 years. There was no, nothing more fun than a small-sided day after a big game. No score. No coaching. I did it. I did it for 10 years. Small-sided soccer after a big game, an intense game with the newspaper constantly ragging us because we're below 500, and, and the coaches just play small-sided today. Oh my God, you bring back your 12 year old, 12 year old days and you're just having fun. No, no, completely. Anyway, if, if you, I'm sorry to backtrack actually, but um, 
I, I just wanted to make a little bit more of a focus on the part that we were talking about, the importance of free play and the importance of of what, what used to happen spontaneously in many places, and it still does in some others, but it's um, all the pickup soccer, all the strip soccer, and how important that is in actually developing skill. Um, and I actually searched for some testimonials and because I wanted to say, because we all know it, but I wanted to read it in a way. So I, I searched for maybe two of the bigger best players ever. So I, I found a testimonial from Maradona. I found a testimonial from Lionel Messi. And I'm Argentina, so you guys knew that I was going to do this. Um, and look, look how funny this is, actually. This is a testimonial from Francisco Cornejo. Francisco Cornejo was the first coach that Diego Maradona had at the age of eight in Argentina juniors. And this is what he declares. He says, by the time one of his friends, Goyo Carrizo, they, were, they used to play at the Seven Little Peaches. It was a barren hard ground where the voice of Bishop Fiorito played, like just played fl freely all day, and that's how they knew each other. So had gone to train with Argentinians. The coach, Francisco Cornejo, was looking for more players. So he said, so Goyo, the Maradona's friend said, sir, I got a friend that is better than me. Can I bring him next week? The coach said, yes. So a few, day, a few days later, Cornejo declares, they say people witness at least one miracle in their lives, but most do not even realize. I certainly did. My miracle occurred on that rainy day in Saturday, uh, Saturday in 1969, when an 80 years old kid, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the quote. Uh, when an 80 years old quit, um, did things on the wall that I had never seen before. Now, I always ask the same question is, Maradona, Argentina juniors didn't make Maradona. And the same happens if you want to read the next example. This is about, it's about the Messi. Messi. And what is, what is, what is Messi saying? It's, um, he's saying, I used to play a Grandoli, just a neighborhood, a neighborhood, um, club and then look I did a control F on purpose and I looked for the worst street and he kept saying I would come home have something to eat be back on the street again to play I was always out on the street and always playing football I even kept a ball with me when I was indoors um, and he keeps highlighting and highlighting even the, the, this quote he says I was always in the street always playing football even keep, always keeping the ball with me so he's telling you he was the million hours that they used to play every single day that built the skill. When they reach, when, when Maradona reaches Argentino Juniors or when, Mar or when Messi reaches Barcelona, they didn't make Messi. Messi was there already. Then they shaped him. They organized what he could already do. Even Francisco Cornejo is saying, an 80 year old kid did things that I have never seen before. Where did Maradona learn that? Just playing, playing a million hours a day. So my point is, if we all know that this free play and maximizing the number of hours that a child spends on the ball, if we all know it, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? Sometimes this is just an opinion and please everybody feel free to even encourage to disagree. Sometimes I feel like we put such a strong focus on the session itself, but maybe we don't place the focus on trying to increase the number of playing hours a week that a child is playing soccer. And we know now, and we know about all of these testimonies and history, that that might be actually what has the highest impact. And that's why, to connect the dots now, that's how in the last couple of weeks, Tim and I and, and the coaching education team, we've been talking a lot about our 70 games philosophy. What is our 70 games philosophy? It's the expression of this. It's to say, we want players to play a lot and there's nothing more specific than the game itself and that of course does not mean that every training session is make a 5v5 sit on the ball and don't say anything of course not but what is it what is the spirit of the 70 games is we say we would like players to play 70 games 70 11 11 scrimmages on a, on a calendar year actually Tim, if, if you want to tell the story of how you came up with the 70 games rule I think that's really cool, too. Yeah, it'll take 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I read one book during my high school years, and it was My Life in the Beautiful Game. Slobo, who wrote that book? My Life in the Beautiful Game. My Life Pele. in the Beautiful Game. My Life in the Beautiful Game was written by Pele. Megan, did you hear this book? I did not. I read uh, Pavel Medved's book, which is also excellent. 
my life in the beautiful game. It was Pele, and it's a really cool story about when he was a youth and pro and all this stuff. And um, I just fell in love with this book. One of these things that grabbed he was standing at a party. Now he's older now. He's standing at a party and the great players came up around him. He was at a FIFA, you know, um, Ballon d'Or thing. And um, they had a pregame party or a pre-meeting uh, party. Bobby Moore is around him. And he said about a half a dozen players came around and said, why were you so exceptional, better than the rest? And he said three things. Play 11 months. I mean, these aren't, these aren't, going to earth shatter you guys everybody this is stuff that yeah but he said play 11 months out of the year play 70 games and go find a good coach <laughs> i was 15 years old when i read that and that stuck to me to this day now how exactly. does a 15 year old go find a good coach how, i literally guys literally when i was 15 years old i put i made this handwritten pencil uh, sheet because I played on a men's team, I played on my high school team, I played on my club team, and I played in my state ODP team. And I kept track of my 70 games because I had four different teams I was playing for. I kept track of them. And then I purposely, as, as stupid as I was, I tried going and finding the best coach. How does a 15-year-old go find a good coach? How does a, how does a 15-year-old know what a good coach is? When I went and searched out Luce Hagastumi, head coach of the Air Force Academy, played for... Um, uh, a national team, which one was it? It was uh, Guada, Guadalajara, Guada, Guatemala, Guatemala. Played for the Guatemala National Air Force National Team coach. He taught me so much. And of course, I played 11 months out of the year because I, I love football. Now, I carry that, I carried that philosophy on when I became a, a, a club coach, a director of coaching. Even when I was coaching the girls' national team, we played 70 games. Some of them were, you know, we can go on and on about what 70 games mean. But there were scrimmages against the U13 boys because I wanted to kick their butt 10-0. Or, you know, I wanted to get a hard game and we, we would fly down to Brazil. I had our, what do you call the calendar now today? The peak calendar thing? Intensity count? What do you guys call it now in the, in the Federation? A periodized calendar. Peri periodization, yeah. I just call it my intensity calendar. I, I knew when I wanted to win and when I wanted to lose. And when I wanted hard games and soft games, at best I can. I had to manipulate it last minute, but I wanted my team to be six, three, and one. I wanted my girls to lose. We would scrimmage the full team, the full women's national team, or I'd, I'd play against the boys' top college team. We would lose seven zero, you know, and then my girls come back down to earth. I'm, I'm doing it with my U12 boys. 70 games, find a good coach and play 11 months out of the year. That was Pele. Completely, no, completely. Now, it, now, what's what's the spirit behind the, the 70 games philosophy? And, and the way I understand it, and you wrote it, team, so you can correct me about this one, but the way that I understand it is we want to be specific. We want to give 70 learning opportunities in the most specific activity that you can play, that is 11, 11 itself. So, you know, because we always find this question of people saying, like, hey, it's, important, it's impossible to fit 70 full formal uh, games on a calendar year. And we know it's extremely complicated. Maybe in a season, you play, what, 40 normally, oh, uh, including tournaments, maybe about 40, seven, uh, 40, 11, 11 uh, formal games. But there are a lot of ways that you can provide that stage as well, right? I always give the same example. Let's suppose that Megan is working on building out of the back and I'm working on pressing and she has a U17 and I have a U16. Well, maybe on a Thursday night, we play 40 minutes one against the other. And that's, that's another learning stage that you provided, extremely, extremely specific. Yep. Now, the next part of this to me is super important as well, because, and please don't take anything as black or white when we say every, life is on the grace, but um, what's the expression of the 70 games or the spirit of the 70 games at the grassroots level? And to me, it's what I was talking before. It's like, if we know that from free play and from playing a million hours, um, is where skill actually appears and creativity arises. We need to we need to to maximize that. We need to create opportunities to increase that number of playing hours. That's why that's why we wrote at the grassroots levels the seventy games rule is expressed through the constant encouragement, club initiatives to increase to increase the overall playing time of the participant. That doesn't mean increasing the number of training sessions. 
it means providing opportunities for the players to play more time in direct confrontation. And I would really like to highlight that last part that says direct confrontation. And I'll say it as the lead and the person that provides a program, like the train at home program in which it's individual. That's an alternative. There's nothing wrong about it. You can do it, but that doesn't replace playing 2v2, playing 3v2 for four hours. It's not the same when you have to play in a sport like this one against somebody else. Direct confrontation is fundamental, in my opinion. Does anybody want to add anything about that? What I think, uh, guys, uh, that uh, lots of coaches don't see difference between uh, uh, developmental uh, uh, part of, of players' uh, life and uh, uh, this time, you know, when they are comp- finished product and when they are competing. So we can see lots of uh, sessions that are designed in a way that uh, are compatible with already finished player, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Once, in my mind, when you bre- break the session down to teach certain principle of the game, uh, that applies only to uh, uh, adults, you know, to finished players, because you want to uh, work on the problem, you know, that, that you have in the game. It's more tactical approach than technical. When you are working with young players, you have to teach the game, all the principles at the same time. Because if you are starting to isolate them, they got confused. You know, you get in the same situation that Tim described uh, with shooting. You know, you shoot the ball and then you f- don't follow rebound, them, right? Or you don't uh, run to pick the ball behind the goal or, you know, you just turn off, you know. And that's why I think, you know, approach in designing sessions for youth players uh, is uh, a kind of similar to what is done for players that already finished product. And uh, we are not doing it. At my academy, we are, I'm asking my coaches to uh, basically uh, 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 look at everything in a game. And major thing is to teach players to read the game by themselves. You know, we, we are, we are uh, using opportunities, you know, to, to show them uh, and to verify what they see in a game in certain situations. Uh, that is something that we learned on our own because we had... Uh, uh, probably four or five hours every day playing uh, soccer on the streets. And uh, uh, as we said, learning from the game or watching older guys playing uh, or getting invited by older guys to play with them. And then, you know, as a younger player, learning from older players in the field. So those are all things. But I never in my career as a youth player uh, was uh, uh, exposed to coaching that was teaching me specific thing, one thing at a time. You know, they never broke the game uh, in, in, in pieces. And that's my approach with my coaches is uh, uh, your session has to be as close as possible to the real soccer game. Has to, has to have, a, uh, has, to be, has to satisfy three elements. It has to be full enjoyment in soccer game, lots of repetitions and high quality coaching. Those three things uh, are objective for every session. Even with adults, you know, with professionals, if they don't enjoy practice, you won't get 100% out of them. And good teams, winning teams are those that are enjoying process, you know, that are, that are, that are, that are, and then they like the coach, all right, because uh, you have to do two sessions per, per day. And if they're not fun, then you got saturated, you know, and, and you are not mentally. Ill. So same thing, you know, when you go to younger players, it's even more important. So what I did, I put together uh, something that I call 10 elements of uh, good coaching. And, uh, and uh, those are kind of uh, elements that I'm trying to develop with my coaches. You know, uh, when they're approaching to the, to the session, uh, they have to satisfy these three principles. And uh, basically, uh, when they work on themselves, they have to work on developing uh, the ability to satisfy these 10 these 10 elements you know i, I would say that that uh, rush has great summary of what we are trying to do passion and purpose so basically how we are going to develop passion and what is purpose am i right you know i think that uh, what you guys started to do is phenomenal and uh, i think with discussions that we are having right right now uh, uh, we should be able to create environment in modern society, because uh, time when Tim was growing up and I was growing up, will never come back. 
you know, there will be no free playing time. There will be no uh, socializing uh, on, on our own. Kids are never going to be without player supervision. So we have to bring that uh, environment in uh, this modern society. And what I'm thinking of is uh, 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 enabling to my players to play as much as possible futsal. So I'm trying to find places uh, uh, and sponsors to do this uh, urban uh, uh, soccer thing, you know, on parking lots uh, where you play 4v4 plus goalie. Uh, and we will try to engage our players almost daily to do that. So that's without coaches, I'm right. We, they'll make a team, they come and play. We have our sessions, but that would be uh, that thing, you know, that they can they can do still in safe environment, you know. Is that because... indoors? Futsal, no, no, it's out, indoor? uh, outdoors. Uh, this year, last year, we, we didn't go indoor at all because of COVID. So we trained uh, uh, to the middle of December, uh, as long as turf fields were available, and people loved it. I mean, uh, people love outdoors. And uh, if we had access to turf fields year round, I would never go indoors anymore. You know, because uh, our players loved it, parents loved it. I mean, everything was everything yeah, was yeah. very, very favorable. Uh, can you spend another minute or two? Did, mm -hmm. did you invite the kids out? Did they have teams? <laughs> did they? Uh, well, what we did, uh, we told them just to create teams uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, six to seven players, you know, among their own team. And then, you know, they just come and play. We, we put groups of older players like uh, 14 and up, and then younger players. And then they will just come and play. Really? Okay. I, so, you know what? First of all, thank you very much. Second, later, I think you said two things that are extremely important. Um, the first one is, and I think it relates to what Tim was saying before, when he was saying, you got to be careful about your drills because you might be creating the wrong habit like you should, but you don't follow through, for example, for the rebound, for the second. Um, and you're saying the same thing in a way, and I think that's extremely important. When when it's when when the activities are not too um, similar to the game, you have to be aware that there's a there's a how do you kind of like it? Not a piano concertist. It's a, he's a director of an orchestra. His name is Daniel Barenboim, and he's one of the best in the world. And he plays piano. And he said once, when I'm rehearsing uh, with my musicians. You have to be very careful about breaking down the masterpiece in too many pieces because they're not easy to stick together after. You can't really break it down that much. The game is the game. If you break it down too much, that, that's probably not going to favor learning after because things are connected. Um, so I think that one is very, very important. And the second one is what you're saying, like as your futsal brand, I think it's completely brilliant. And that's exactly to what I'm referring to. Sometimes, in my opinion, we put the focus way too much on how to maximize the session itself. And there's nothing wrong about it. Of course that that's right. But maybe we lose a little bit of focus on how we're actually creating, um, how we're, we're maximizing the playing time, the weekly playing time of the player. What you're doing to me, it's brilliant because you're giving a free space for them to play and play and play and play. I prefer a player that plays 15 hours a week than another one that plays eight hours a week that then goes home and it's not really doing anything. Oh my God. So. I think that's incredibly important. And I've heard this from, from different clubs and I, and I love that many of you are doing it. And those that are done, I would truly encourage you to. Washington Rush, for example, Sean Connors told me the other day, they have a really cool program. They start training at 6 p.m. So at 4 p.m., all of the players can come and the fields are set up, but nobody's allowed to coach. So it's just pick up games for two hours. Then at six weeks, we start training. And they do that every day. And I think that's brilliant and probably way more impactful than a lot of other discussions and debates that we tend to have. Yeah, you know, there's, there's, yeah, there's certain etiquette in small sided that people don't know. Etiquette in football, there's certain etiquette. And Slobo, I want you to listen to this. There's the small sided soccer that's played in Brazil that nobody knows what the score is because the game's played for seven hours. It's from sun up till sundown. Now watch this. This is crazy. Yet the kids are still competitive and fighting over the next goal. The, my kids and the kids in Brazil so I said, that's not a goal. Yes, it was. No, it isn't. That wasn't. It hit the post and went out. No, what? And it's like, wait a minute. What's the mentality here? 
they don't even know what the score is. It could be 552 to 675, but they still compete over the next goal. And now they'll work it out. It'll eventually some kid will go, forget it. Let's just get the ball in play. The two kids that are arguing, they're going to argue for five more seconds, but then they're going to get in and play. The coach stays out of it and they sort it out. The kids will sort it out. And the etiquette is eventually if somebody gets hurt and falls down, the kids will stop. That's etiquette. You, you'll, the kids will just stop and play. They'll just wait and they'll just wait. Or maybe they, they do score, but then they wait. What else is etiquette? Um, etiquette is you don't do the two-footed slide tackle. It's, it's your teammates. We'll save that for Saturday. It's etiquette. You don't dive and cheat on purpose. Not in this game because there's no referees. So the kids are learning this etiquette that is around the world that's accepted. You know, it's just, it's kind of there. You don't keep score, but it's competitive. Now there's some, there's some of us that will do indoor soccer and it's a competition. And I think it's okay, but I think we miss something. Now the kid's not going to nutmeg somebody because, oh boy, I'll get yelled at and my team's going to be, because this is zero, zero, and there's one minute left. Where if you're playing real street soccer, the kid can really, really feel free. Street soccer is not a score. You, you don't keep score. That's, that's futsal tournament stuff. It's a big difference. Yeah, it is uh, very important to, to, to mention imagination, am I right? You cannot develop imagination in a structured environment, you know, because you have to follow structured directions. Uh, only environment is free playing environment where imagination is developed. And, uh, and uh, that is what kids are supporting each other in because they cherish skill. They cherish, uh, I mean, that's what we cherish the most. When somebody uh, does, does something that others cannot do then we will try to do it. You know, you watch it, some older kid does something uh, technically phenomenal, some great idea, you know, in, 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 a, in, in, in an execution. And then we follow, that's how we are learning and competing with each other. And that was much more cherished than scoring five goals or, you know, yeah. being strong in tackle. And that develops completely different culture. Correct, correct, correct. You know, about six months ago, Slob, I did an exercise with a bunch of coaches and it was Liverpool versus, I don't know, another EPL team. And I stopped the guy on Liverpool. And I said, Slobo, what could this player on the ball do? Well, he's in the attacking third. He could do an in-swinging ball. Okay, now, Megan, what else could he do? He could start it over and, and switch the point of attack. Uh, Pablo, what else could he do? He could pull it back to his left to it and do an in-swinger. What else could he do? He could do a wall pass. Now, follow me, guys. Follow me. Now the player does a play. The Liverpool guy does one of the plays that the coach has picked. See, he, he picked the one that Joe Blow picked. He picked the one that Pablo picked. Pablo said he was going to do an in-swinger, and sure enough, he did it. But every other play was correct, too. Mm. All the other five were all good answers, too. You know the differences between a youth coach and this pro coach, the pro player? The pro player can do any of those because they're skilled to do it. Now let's say the Liverpool kid, the pro, crosses it and they score a goal off of it everybody goes what a great choice now megan's kid does it and she's 13 years old tries it and she shanks it out of bounds and megan says you should have started the ball over you should have switched the point of attack we are all guilty of that when in reality is there's six answers out there for that kid but we allow him to do the mistake and then we say well that was the wrong thing a great player can do any one of those six things so where does your coaching come in? It goes back to let the kid do his thing, get better at it, repeat that cross, repeat where they're at, let them try it over and over again, wait till their skills get better and better. And that's where my functional training comes in, where I get confused. Should I do small sided today or should I do functional training? Crossing, left foot, right foot, um, uh, passing the ball, doing the wall pass. There's gotta be a combination of both because my kid that's crossing the ball, this is where I go back to functional training. If I play five, every 70 games, every five days, I got a game. 70 games divided by 365 is a game every five days. Well, the pro player, I did this for 10 years. I know I'm not BSing. This is not like, well, he never played pro. When we played a hard game, my favorite day, the next day 
was working on functional stuff, just working on 20 crosses. And then maybe I got to do some clearing of heading. I do 20, 30 of them. And then maybe I got to do, let's say I want to do um, a dribble, a cross off the dribble. So I'll do 10 of those. And now my body feels good. I'm gearing for the next game. So I try and, I try and copy back to this six choices for the player. Six choices for that player. Start it over, switch a point of attack, do it quick, drop it back, pull up your foot, and pass it firm to the center back to switch a point of attack. Now I want you to do 10 of them crossing with the in-swinger. Now I want you to do 10 with the out-swinger. And now I want you to do a wall pass and then hit it one touch off of the cross. Because that was the choice that I saw last Saturday with Liverpool. Now my kids can't do that. But every day I strive to do functional training so that they have the tools to pick any pass any choice that they want it's their choice it's it's crazy coaching the, the more i know the less i i want to get out of it i want to stay away from the kid i don't want to tell them this is the right thing or this is the wrong choice yeah tim when uh you know at my time uh of, uh you know when there was no structured coaching for kids that are uh younger than U11. So when we were fourth grade at that time, clubs would do tryouts, and that's where you were starting the program. So we would go there. There were like uh, five, uh, uh, there were two, now they would say Premier Division, then there were three, uh, uh, first division, there were five, six, uh, third division, and so on. And then, you know, you try, you go first for Premier Division, you don't make it, you go to second. And, you know, finally you find a place in one of these academies, they were all free, right? If you qualify, you have uh, all the same. And all these new teams were playing in the same league. You know, it was local league, no right. much uh, travel. So you can do what you just said. You can have as many games as possible uh, by using street car. You know, you don't use the buses or everything because you had the 25, 30 academies in Sarajevo, for instance, in my, in my time. So we would play, we would play year round. Uh, 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 when we come there on tryouts, they were expecting us technically and decision-making to know everything. So when we start to train there, it was tactics 11 v 11. So starting from U11 at that time, I don't, I'm not saying that that's good, but at that time that was expectation. Like uh, like uh, this coach said about Maradona, you know, he got uh, he got eight years old player that is uh, that is finished. Am I right? He can he just needs to grow. Am I right? He's already brilliant. So basically, that that's what that's what expectation was, and uh, uh, we worked on tactical portion of the game. We were, you know, learning first general tactics, and then as we were growing and developing in specializations, they will break us up, and then we will have specific training. For for particular roles, am I right? That that was uh, that. But they never taught us anything technically. Uh, we would have functional training that was uh, 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 required repetition of technical execution. But every session was tactical, you know, at 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 at, at, at the club level. And then we will go back home and we will play for three, four, five hours uh, street soccer. Let's say on handball field forever. And that's what was part of that. Uh, development and even when I start to play uh, uh, play as a, as a, as a play a senior player, uh, I would continue playing. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, when you come back, everybody. I mean, regardless how you national team player or yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. when you come back to your to your community, uh, there were times you know when you come out and you uh, show off. I mean, that's if people don't know you in your area, you know you are nobody. You can be whatever. <laughs> Yeah, so that, you know, that's Slobo, the culture, you know. That, that, yeah. Slobo, our, your three training sessions that you conduct with your U12 boys teams is not enough. And you can, you, if you do that the next uh, 10 years, those three training sessions aren't enough. What you have to create, Slobo, is those three training sessions and during that time, passion and love. So they train an extra three hours during the day, one in the morning, two after. They stay extra with the older team. This is, this is what makes a great player. It's the coach that creates that love and passion. Diego Maradona fell in love with the game because he watched Boca versus River. And his mom and dad were screaming, oh, my God, Boca beat River. And no, they didn't. The referee cheated us. 
he fell in love with the game. It's the culture that helps create that. Unfortunately, United States, the culture is crap. But could, could the coaches have a little bit of an influence to help it? We can say, that was a great ball. Tomorrow is futsal. I'm going to be out there. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm excited to see Johnny do that nutmeg again. And then they laugh at each other. And Bobby, did you that, did that little sombrero where you flicked it over his head? Those two phrases there are 10 times more important than saying, your wall pass needs to be with the outside of the foot. And then when you support, you got to do it at the right time. And I'm going, you're missing the point. The coach, the kid doesn't care. The kid wants to know, dude, you did a nutmeg and you scored the great, you scored a great goal. And three of you are involved in that play. And all three girls high, you know, high five each other. Now I'm creating an environment where the kids want to go train more or train with the older team. Slobo, I had seven of my girls, their 06s come to my 03, my 09 training session yesterday. Seven of them. They're three years younger, but they love the environment. They love the small sided. My kids are getting better because they're playing, not because of Tim Schultz. You know, it's it's it, it, this is vital, and and that, that I think that backtracks to the to the main point in in the philosophical conversation of player development. That is, what are we doing to increase the number of hours that the play that the player is playing overall? We Correct. we all put the focus on. How can I make my session better? And again, there's nothing wrong about that. I think it's perfect. We should do that. Correct. You know? But what else are you doing? Like, think about your club. What else are we doing to try to increment the number of hours that they play? What are we doing to try to instill <clears throat> passion? Because passion, you can teach it, but it's contagious. So do you actually watch a video of, of uh, Boca versus River with your team so they can see what passion is in the world? Do you actually try to have initiatives to try to Share that feeling because it's contagious. What are we doing in our clubs for that? Because that to me has the highest impact at the end. Yeah, Pablo, I, I'll tell you, let's say uh, I still have in Michigan, I moved, uh, uh, moved back uh, uh, fully uh, uh, in January, 2020. I still have in Michigan a futsal facility. Uh, it is a full size futsal field with uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, with uh, 50 by uh, uh, 70 feet uh, uh, technical training areas, speed agility equipment, fully equipped. And uh, that's where basically I started uh, 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 for us Michigan uh, uh, futsal, futsal program. So basically it was same thing as uh, I'm doing it in Canada. Uh, play, teams would register and it was rush. Uh, Rush, uh, let's say Saturday, Sunday, playing all, all, all the uh, all day long, and uh, basically uh, three days in a week when there's no training, it's also open for playing. So I, we had lots of kids that joined, and the uh, best players that are that are in Michigan Rush, they are all uh, part of that program. You know, they 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 actually play every day. Uh, here in Canada, uh, I I'm still looking for the place, you know, because. Uh, uh, it's very difficult here to get uh, a place to set the field up, even nowadays. You know, it is uh, all temporary. You, you have to set it up and then to move it, you know, and, and crap like that. And that's pro that makes problem with the scheduling because as long as you don't have space or place that is a kind of set as a rush uh, playground where players can come whenever they want to and play, you know, right. that, it's very difficult to do it. We do have passion. Players would love to do it. But because of, uh, of uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, availability of the, of the space where they can come and uh, play safely, uh, that, that is the problem, you know, to maintain it real year round. So I think we achieved the uh, interest, but uh, we are trying now to, to, uh, to make these places, you know, and... Uh, uh, Toronto area is huge, so we would need, let's say, three locations. So players, let's say, from Toronto don't have to go all the way to Milton, which is like 60 kilometers away, to, to just to play futsal. So we are looking for something in Etobicoke, something yeah. in Mississauga, and something in Oakland. Yeah, yeah so no. we'll keep going. Go find that facility. It's, it's a game changer for your kids. Completely. So, so I, I, wanted, I wanted to bring it back so that we can make one step forward into understanding um, this document and it's um, 
this is, I'm not about to say the opposite, not at all. I mean, we, it's great that we all share this, this belief that, that of the importance of free play and maximizing the number of hours that, um, that players play in direct confrontation again. But now that doesn't mean, of course, like I was saying before that the training session itself, it doesn't matter anymore. And we should just like, of course we want to have top class training sessions. And that brings me back to one of the original questions and why we started working uh, on this so much with Megan and Chris P that I, that I got to thank again for the, all their efforts as well. Um, that is, we definitely know that Canada and Colorado and Florida and Mississippi, they, they are different clubs. They work in different landscapes. But we, the Rush, we're a hundred clubs, but how can we still be one while we respect our differences? So that was the, that was the real question that we had with the team. And we said, we're not really going to give anything too prescriptive because we have to allow for flexibility. But at the same time, we want to be connected. And that's how we started working on this um, on this graph that you can see that we call it the rush blue thread. That is basically trying to define eight principles that every training session exceptions apart because there are 100 exceptions. Huh? Again, nothing is really like black and white. Everything lives on the gray. There are a million reasons why you might break one of these principles on a certain day um, and for a certain for a certain need. But how can we try to connect all of us? So again, we came up with these eight principles that we think reflect this philosophy and these ideas that we've been presented. Um, it's probably too small, so let me make it bigger. So the first one is like, and please, um, Meg, because we did this together. If you want to explain. Uh, any of them, instead of doing it myself, you have a better accent and English is your first language, so you might do a better job than me. So, <laughs> um, so one of the things that we said, I think this should be present in every training session is number one, and I'll take this one, is use conditions to encourage competition. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you that on Wednesday you should work on this topic or the other. I'm not telling you that the third week of your U19 should be working on this or that because that's out of con that's prescriptive that's out of context it, you don't know it's it's impossible it's not a one size fits all but this is something that you can apply in every session that is use conditions to encourage competitions and let's start at the very beginning kids children youth people at every level when they're playing soccer they like competing so it's not like you're forcing them to do anything that, that they dislike use conditions to encourage competition what could be an example of that do we use conditions like, hey, last goal wins? Or even if you're running with the ball from one line to the other, whatever you're doing, hey, let's see who can do it better. Let's see who can do it faster. Can you break your own record? There are so many ways of actually adding a competitive spice in the, se in the session, in the activity. And I think we think that that should be something present in every session. Megan, would you like to do the next one? Maybe there is an ongoing cycle of feedback and reflection between the player and the coach. Sure. I think this is, you know, obviously coaching in general is giving feedback, but sort of encouraging it to be a two-way dialogue um, and making sure that, that that process of preparing players to train, executing a training session, and then helping them reflect on it. And that can be as simple as, you know, most coaches at the end of a session will bring their team in and there's some kind of reflection on how the session went or how it applies to maybe what happened this past weekend, what's coming up, like those sorts of things. So really being intentional about that feedback and reflection cycle and not just having it be a one-way process of a coach delivering or giving information to players during a session. Um, you know, I know Tim does this quite a bit off the field as well, um, sort of with team Zooms and, and Google Hangouts and reviewing film and looking at pro games and and all different ways that we can help give feedback and help players reflect on their own performance and maybe on how it relates to the game as a whole so making sure that there's an intentional plan for that yeah completely completely and and, and while you were saying that i kept thinking of examples for, for for instance something that i consider a good sign of my own coaching is when after the session one of the players approaches me and says like hey coach you know what you were talking about this i have a question or i'm or i'm encountering this problem during games i have this question when that happens it goes beyond the question and sometimes maybe i don't even have the answer but i think it's yeah. a good sign that that player trusts me and he feels he's not he doesn't fear me 
So he's open to just talking and trying to start this ongoing cycle of feedback and reflection. And I think that's fundamental for learning. Um, I'll, I'll take the next one. Each con activity contains decision-making elements. I'm a big fan of this one. Um, why? Because this is, this, is, this is science. It's not even myself. The best players in the world, what is it that they do different than others? Is they make better decisions. When they reach that level, everybody's technically proficient. Everybody's, everybody's fit. Most of them, at least, have a really good uh, have really good psychological traits. Now, so what's 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 the difference? It's actually the number of right decisions that you make. How do we expect them to get better at making decisions if we start doing forty five minutes of patterns in which they're mentally dead in that moment? Is I go from A to B, I go from B to A, C, and from C to H, and what's the thought process? None, none. So how do we expect them to be better at making decisions if there are no decisions to be made? So to me, vital, your activities, they should include decision-making elements. That doesn't mean by no means, hey, you should never do patterns in your life. No, of course not. It's not a black or white situation. If you want to do a little bit, good. But maybe do 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or maybe you have a very specific reason why someday, why one day you want to take it slow, just work on something, show an example or something. But when patterns or, or activities of the type are the core of the session, I tend to look at that session and be like, mm, there's something that I'm not liking about it. Um, that's my opinion as well. Um, next one, Meg, would you like to do the next one? Sure, and I'll, I'll just tack onto that. I think even pattern yeah. play can have decision-making. Um, as simple as having two different visual cues if the nine checks into space, this is the pattern we play. If the nine checks away, this is the pattern. So that there's sure. still, even in unopposed pattern play or unoppo unopposed sort of technical training, I think we can, if we plan it ahead of time intentionally, there can still be decision-making um, for, sure. for players. And I think when coaches say it's not possible, I think that's a, a lack of maybe planning or lack of creativity in some ways. Um, so the next one would sort of design of this session week um, kind of season plan meets the needs of, of players and teams. And I think this is one that, you know, I think the next um, kind of information that will be sent out is, is kind of updated age group guides. So this is sort of the tool that, that we would expect coaches or hope that coaches are using to make sure that, you know, we're probably not teaching U9, U10, U11 players a, a blindsided run between two center backs off the back post. Um, that's maybe psychologically spatial IQ, like these sorts of things might not be based on the needs of those players in those age groups. So thinking about what are the needs of a collective group of players between a certain age range, where are they at developmentally, physically, mentally, um, you know, technically and tactically, and, and trying to make sure that the session meets those needs. And obviously the closer we can be to replicating whatever game they play at that age, whether it's 77 or 99, 4v4 maybe, or Lemby 11, if we can replicate the demands of that game in our activities, it's probably meeting their needs in that particular age group. Very good. Um, I'm actually going to take another one randomly myself, that it's um, because this one's maybe the one that I'm the, um, the most for, or the, or the first one that came to my mind when we thought about this, that is minimum 75% of the session should be game-based and opposed. Um, Again, this is, it's, it's, I don't even think it needs too much of an explanation. I mean, after all our conversation about how the game is the teacher and um, how to create learning environments and why you can't really break down the game too much. Um, I like it like that, game-based and opposed. There has to be direct confrontation. So again, minimum 75, it's actually easier to accomplish than you would think um, to have 75% of your session game-based and opposed. Um, Tim, would you like this one? Uh, would you like to talk about this one? Maybe that we we spoke to is um, the ball is rolling at least 70 70 percent of the time in the session. Well, it's probably a it's a cliche. It, it means it means you're playing. It means whether it's small sided, big big, um, talking less. You know, I know set pieces would be in there, but that would be actually a moving ball set pieces. It it means you're talking less and playing more. 100%. Coach a little bit more on the flow. Sometimes we underestimate how, how many interruptions we make. And then when we see ourselves in video or something like that, we're like, oh, wow. I thought that freeze was 
30 seconds and he took like two wins. So. I, I think, I think, let me go back to Megan. Megan, I think you can, I know you can coach any topic within 7v7 or 11v11. And I think that's a question I'm asking everybody. I can coach any topic and go straight to 11v11, any topic, because the game is perfect and it'll present itself. Now, it might not come up very often, that topic I give Megan, but it'll be there. She can fabricate it a little bit. And nobody can critique her and say, well, that's not game realistic. It happened in the game. It, it was in the game and she was teaching a wall pass. So you, my opinion, you can't go wrong if you're doing 70% of that ball's rolling, even if it's even if it's 100%, mm -hmm. I think you're gonna be okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, May, would you like to do coaching points are based on visual cues? You told me some, some couple of really interesting facts about this one. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the research now in the last, you know, five to 10 years, especially around skill acquisition and application in flow-based sports, which ours is, um, is around how to teach decision-making. And we know that teaching decision-making is at its core, being able to teach players what to look for and how to respond to that. And so I think it can be really easy as a coach. We're taking in so much visual information and it can be easy to say step, drop, squeeze, press, those sorts of things, but really making sure in a training environment that that information is tied to a visual cue. When the center back has her head down, step. When you know this happens, drop. Instead of just saying the word, making sure it's tied to the cue, in a way to then give the player the information that they can look for to apply it themselves. Otherwise, they have no idea why you said step in a lot of circumstances. And the next time they're in that situation, they're not looking at the same thing you're looking at in all cases. And so I think being really conscious of if you're teaching pressing, for example, or pressing when the opponent's trying to build out and there's specific cues that you're watching for to get your, you know, two forwards to press, really being specific in your planning process so that you're communicating consistently those same cues to players as you're giving them information. And then they're able to self-assess, you know, is it, Megan, is it kind of along the lines of reading the game? Is it yeah, similar? Yeah. Absolutely. But being okay. really specific about um, what are those cues? Because I think as coaches, when we really boil it down, if I've just told a forward to step, I saw something that told me, that's the moment to press. And we don't always yeah, take point. the time to then really think through like, what did I see? Oh, I well, saw that the point. goalkeeper was doing this and this was happening and body shape was bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think it, it's a, I would say a higher level of coaching, um, but it's probably the single most important thing we can do for players is teaching you know, them Megan, what, what I'm looking at as a coach so that they can look for the same thing. You know, Megan, I came up with this stupid thing when I was co doing my personal coaching um, growth. And Slobo said it earlier, teach the players to read the game. And you're saying the same thing. You know, I, I'm going, but first I have to do what Megan said. I have to teach the player what I'm reading. So if I go to math, I say, first of all, one plus one is two, right? You know, one plus one is two. And I tell them the answer because I got to do that because that's how you read it. That's how you know that the Q2 is one plus one. That's the same with the player now. Okay, I saw this. Now you should do this. You can do other things, but I saw this. You should try this. Now I go, I see it again as a coach. Now I tell my sweeper, hey, it's one plus one. They go, oh, okay. Instead of saying, hey, it's one plus one is two. I used to do that for the longest time. I told them the answer and the question every time. And the kid never formed another pathway. And then I would try and lift away the one plus one thing. And I'd say, hey, there's, look what's happening. Now they're going, oh, I see one plus one. And I know the answer too. Right. Now, as I got better as a coach, I'm going, well, there's different ways to get to two. You know, four minus two is two. So you, you got a problem out there. Here's a good solution. I got to teach that at younger age, Slobo. I can't just say, read the game. They're like, what the hell? Read the game. I don't know what 49 times four is. I have to help them get there first. Right. And then I say, okay, there's a problem in front of you. How do you solve it? Now I'm teaching the kid how to read the game. Because sometimes they'll never read the damn game. 
Right. And I think the perfect example is like, we can go to education, right? If somebody hands me a book in French and says, exactly. Megan, just pay attention and read the book. Learn. Tell me what it. it's about. Yeah. I, have no, I don't know the language of the book and I don't know the letters and I don't know the sounds and I don't know what they mean. And so I think really at a young age and even for higher level players, being in professional environments, youth national yeah. team environments, like they don't, they've not always been taught the cues. Yeah. Um, and so I think really trying to, yeah, help the players see what you see. Totally. And then from there, if everybody sees the same thing, then we can teach them the response when they've seen it. Correct. If, if we can teach young players to recognize when an attacker's head is down, perfect. Because there's so much we can teach once oh they know the attacker's head is down. We can teach six responses. Um, but I think if we don't ever teach – what to look for. And we're just right. trying to get them to do these different things. So I think, again, it's, um, it's, I think it's simple. And I <coughs> think it's a little bit when you hear it and when you see it, it's pretty self-explanatory, but I think it's probably, I would say one of the things I see coaches neglect or forget the most often. Totally. Now, can you do it in a fun way quickly? Wow. <laughs> you know, math, are you kidding me? You're going to lose a classroom if you're just boring. The teacher that's fun, gets it exciting, you know, pulls out two apples or something or, you know, now can you do it fast and can it be fun? Now you're a great teacher. One thing, Pablo, uh, 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 the reason why we are looking to maximize number of games is basically to uh, uh, create environment in which game will become a teacher. Uh, read it to learn to read the game you have to play a lot okay so i think that the biggest influence of number of games in game is a teacher type of thing is developing uh, 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 iq for the game uh, 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 decision making and reading the game because uh, you know it's the same thing once when you learn the basics uh, as megan said letters and everything else uh, by reading that book over and over again you know it by heart but i'll, I'll also add though i'll add though the important piece there is we need to help give players a framework for what they should look for when they're in the game otherwise yeah, you can hand me 700 books in french it's i'll learn it eventually it no. may take me a decade instead of a couple of months if I have guidance and help and I know what to look for and I know how to read it and I, I know. So I think really working on the game is the teacher, but if we don't give a lens, we can't accelerate development. Why would they come and play? Why would they sign up for club if they can learn it on their own? The purpose of a club environment, the purpose of a coach, I think is to accelerate that growth. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why we talk about uh, uh, going from uh, easy and simple to difficult and complex. And that's why using small-sided games, uh, 2v2, 3v3, 4v4 to progress, you know, in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, reading the game, you know, uh, uh, process. Because, you know, if you would take somebody to uh, play 11v11 game uh, after they have just basic technical skills, it would be the same thing to give him a French book uh, when they don't know French. And, uh, you know, by going through this process of uh, small-sided games, uh, we will be uh, able to bring that to the point to read the book, you know. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just saying that that is much easier environment uh, for coach to uh, uh, help players to uh, make right decision and create these uh, uh, guidelines, I would say, you know, for, for proper decision-making and reading the game, you know. Megan. Is it not? I love your analogy with the, the French in the book, but I think equally as important, and I think we do within Rush, and I guess it's more of a question, is having a common language, whether within our teams or within our club. You know, Tim put, I don't know, when was that, Tim? 2002, 2001, with the player handbook where we have a Rush common language. But, you know, and then having those older players coming into the younger sessions or the younger players going into the older sessions they're all sharing that language and identifying those visual cues. So we don't have the 09 saying one thing and then the 06 is going, hey, shape, sharpen, C or whatever that may be, but it's establishing, again, that common language, just to go with your analogy. 
Yeah, and I think it's it's probably one of the single most important things we can do to ensure long-term player development the same way if you're in math class as a fourth grader and you learn what a denominator is, your fifth grade teacher doesn't call that something different. <laughs> but how often is it that for us as coaches, like the language that I use coming into a new club or maybe a club that doesn't have a common vocabulary, what one coach says, step, press, drop, squeeze is a common one that I, that I see coaches use. And one coach uses squeeze to mean something very different defensively than another. And it, that'd be similar to a fourth grader going into fifth grade math. And now a denominator is some, called something different. Um, subtraction is suddenly called something different. Will they still learn? Sure. They'll, kids are adaptable and they learn pretty quickly. We're lucky for that as adults. Um, but it, it just will take them longer if they have to relearn, like you said, relearn a new set of vocabulary. Um, I think that's probably along with establishing visual cues, I would say a common language and a common vocabulary is I would argue the single most important thing for a club environment for long-term development. Yeah, Megan, there's a problem with that, you know, because every country has different terminology. <laughs> Trust me, I was in many countries. <laughs> So the first thing I had to do is uh, to adapt my uh, communication, you know, to whatever uh, official terminology is. Yeah, uh, and so that's why I think it's yeah. important for, for clubs to have. You yeah. know, I know some of the clubs that I've seen at a, at a very, very, very high level, and even not at that high of a level, but that are really good in player development that have like, a, okay, here's our moments of the game, defending, attacking, transition, or what, however they break the game up these are the phases of the game. These are the core principles and here's the vocabulary of player actions. Um, and, and they have like literally a vocabulary sheet that, that players get, that coaches get. And the expectation is that we all use that common vocabulary. So I think it's, um, yeah, the same way I, I couldn't go, you know, work in South America and continue to tell players to press just because like I speak English and that's my native language. I'd have to learn okay, what's the Spanish equivalent and try to learn in that particular culture, what's the what's the language we use in this club? How important that you mentioned this actually, and because um, when we posted the following document, that was the game model, a lot, a lot of the questions or conversations that we had around it was that, hey, there are game models that are two pages and there are game models that are 180 pages. And they were like, well, yours is not really 180 pages. And we said, my first response was, I know. But I wanted to start somewhere, and what I want, what we wanted to start from was, let's try to, let's try to start having a common lens towards the game. Let's, let's try to call things the same thing across the across the club, so that we can actually help this learning. And that was our main objective. Um, this is really interesting, actually. This is really interesting. And um, in fact, as you guys were talking about the learning aspect aspect, I kept thinking of how sometimes coaches miss the point about performance and learning. And then because when you give a direct indication, the performance might be, uh, might increase right away, but the learning is not really taking place. I think it's a really good sign. And I've, I, I haven't really read this in any um, papers or books, but I think it's a really good sign of my team when we make a mistake, but I see my players argue about why what happened and they start maybe using the concepts that we were working on. So they're starting to read the situation and saying like, yeah, you know why we made this because we failed at doing, uh, playing this principle or we feel that you didn't see that cue. Um, and oh, I think that's a I, good sign that learning is starting to take place. There being autonomous yeah. in that. Yeah. I want to jump in here. Hmm? I, you know, there, I, there's explicitly two separate languages here. One is football language. And then there's a cultural language that a club wants to adapt. There's no doubt, I hope everybody agrees with this, there's no doubt that football language is universal, it's international, and I can go over and play for in Poland, and if the coach doesn't speak one word of, word of English, and he, he, he claps and goes, you know, and then, oh, my shape is not good, because the whole team's pulling up, and I'm not. You know, he... he He's saying, come on, you know, hey, blah, 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 you know, and I'm going to look around and I'm going, oh, okay. The other three guys pulled up and I'm not. And, and hopefully my football language is pretty complete because the club I came from, they know when they should play a long ball, short ball, when I should fake an injury, when I should go fast, when I should drop back. 
10, 10 players are pressing and I'm not, or I'm pressing and 10 players are dropping back. And the coach doesn't have to know my language, but he can tap me on the shoulder and point and kind of try and verbally get across something. Football language, the cues that Megan addressed earlier of, of body language is 10 times more important than a club's language. And I agree, the club language should say pull versus step, but it's more like, you know, ah, everybody up. You could say 10 different things and the team needs to defend the field. Yeah, and I think uh, I would I would say like that's one of the important things about remembering to keep it simple when you do have a club vocabulary and make it obvious. Good point. Right? Like press, that's pretty obvious if pretty that's obvious. what you use as your cue, right? I heard, and I'll be real honest, and I won't use names because it's it's a coach here in Colorado, but I was watching games this past weekend, and one of the coaches that I'm working with yelled to a to a very young team, pineapple. Yeah. It was somehow related to some kind of team shape thing, and clearly the players had been taught what pineapple meant. And I was like, "Hmm, I wonder if we could use a more like straightforward and and obvious phrase or cue to teach those players whatever it is he's trying to teach them." And I think it was really just trying to get them to compress. And for me, I'm like, maybe reorganize or just compress could have been more useful. The kids are young, so they probably like the idea of yelling pineapple. Um, but certainly if I take that team next year, for example, I'm not going to be yelling pineapple. Um, <laughs> and so I think like that's a good example to Tim's point of having a, a language that we all use and we all share is really important. The simpler and more obvious it is, in Correct. some ways, like the easier it is to then ensure that everyone's using it and that, that players are using it over time. Correct. Correct. I, uh, 100% agree. Yeah, when yeah, I just, was, just so everyone knows, it wasn't Tim yelling pineapple. <laughs> yeah, we were thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, guys, just to make it just to make it clear, when I was talking about terminology, I didn't think about uh, 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 cues for players. You know, to for decision making, I was talking about general terminology defining principles of the game. And uh, if you look uh, through through the uh, coaching handbooks of United States only from uh, one book generation to another, you will see a significant difference in definition or selection of principles of attack, defense, transitions, and terminology that is used. And not to talk between different uh, uh, football or soccer associations. So, you know, what I was thinking about is that uh, it is good to, to basically have good definition for a rush clubs and players what these principles are and what we think under these principles okay that is where everything is starting because uh, all all the cues later on are developed based on how players are respecting these principles of the game in different uh, situations of the game absolutely so that's uh, that's where i think we should uh, uh, standardize our terminology because even between my coaches here, we have South Americans, Europeans, uh, everybody will tell you different thing about uh, what are principles of attack. What, although at the end, you know, it, it means the same thing, you know, but when you are explaining to the player from one coach to another, if, you, if, if I would go to Ivan's uh, players and tell them, you know, uh, what uh, Alex uh, is uh, teaching their players, they wouldn't understand uh, half of the, of the terminology that I'm using. That, that is part that I think uh, terminology-wise that we need to address. And then obviously, you know, cues are, are something that uh, is uh, football language. Yeah. No, completely. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, we were having the same conversation about the way that we were breaking down the game, you know, and we said, okay, in attacking, we could talk about building progress and creating finisher in defending. We could talk about denying and protecting. And all of that, and we were saying it's just a convention. Pablo, by the way, you put you put good paper about principles of defense. I liked it a lot. Thank, thank you very I, much. Actually, I'm gonna I, give I, a lot of I, I gotta give a lot of credit to the team, and it wasn't really me. Megan was instrumental doing it. Um, okay, it's, it's very good. I mean, it's good start, starting point if we can do something like that for every uh, uh, every phase of the game, you know, and to break it down mm -hmm. the way you did it in that one. You know, I think that would be that would be very very helpful.
Thank you. Thank you. So, and yeah, so so we, when we were doing that, we were thinking like, well, like Tim Tim always says this, this English saying that there's a thousand ways of skinning a cat, right? And um, basically, you 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 can it's it's a it's an agreement, is what I say at the end. It's just something that we agree on doing. Like, hey, let's present it the same way so that we right. accelerate learning, so that we so that we pass on the same message to the players. Because normally, I mean, normally you could also say like, oh, you know what? I'm just wanna I want to break down the game in attacking and defending and that's it it's just a different category a different way of of, of using a lens towards seeing it or like they do in in south america in south america they say that there are only four actions that are possible in the game that are building finishing um defending and winning the ball back and it's the same it's it's the same it's, they, they're just they're building it's similar to our building progressing and creating so it's, it's just a convention it's just an agreement that we all make so that we pass on the same message um so nothing no those that those that just a comment but the last one and i think this one is important because it also leads to a lot of questions that we are like well that's not really the point um it's um and and, and i'm gonna pass it on to you team if you don't mind that is it's the 4-1 related one that it instead of saying it's 4-1 uh coaching that we use we say yeah. coaches positively to encourage and build confidence um if, if you want to take it from there yeah, um, you know, he just he had this thing saying four to one. Every time you say one, you know, instructional thing, you should say four positive things. Yeah, I, I, I really believe in that. I think there's got to be sincerity there. I think you got to point out, you know, build up the kid's character or build up a coach's character. So it would be, I'm trying to go over my last night. You know, last night I would say, oh, what a ball. Oh, my God. That was amazing. Good strike. And I didn't even say anything. I mean, I didn't, but they knew that I'm engaged and they knew I, I enjoyed what I saw. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to be, that was a good pass, Susie. You know, I mean, I can just, th th sometimes I'll look out of the corner of your eye and you just go, you just hold your head and go, whoa, that's, that's plenty. Or a quick clap. That was a good one. And then, and then once in a while, hey, not bad, but hey, you know what? You should have taken a shot there, gal. You know, so I, I said not bad, but because her choice was to pass it square. That's her choice. But I said not bad, but you're two yards out and there's no goalie in the net. You should have shot it. You know, so I'm saying not bad, but take the shot, gal. You know, that type of thing. So that's, that's all it means. And the cliche of four to one, people would, you know, people would film me and say, Tim, you didn't, you know, you, you, you didn't do four of them. You did three of them. Well, it's just a, it's a saying. Be positive exactly, with yeah. your kids. Be positive. Tell them, tell them they're great, and you're creating an environment that I want to do more. I want to get on the ball more. I want to win more. I want to get involved more. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I what I was trying to refer to. It's like when we used to write in a lot of places. We used to write coach for one, coach for one, coach for one, and we had a lot of conversations with people that were were going to ask us like. Hey, you know what? Research now says that it's five one. Or you know what? You did it three one. We were like, that's not the point. The point is that you're trying to coach positively and build the confidence of the player. Then the four one itself, it's a tool. Just like the sandwich technique is a tool. You say something positive, something instructional, something positive. It's just two tools, but the objective is the same. That is to actually encourage the player and build confidence. Yeah. So and you that's know, I don't think that's that. Yeah. I mean, some of us are instructors on this call or directors or, you know, some of your coaches aren't animated, but they still need to, whatever, call them all in at halftime and just quiet. Maybe they're a quiet coach and they can say, Susie, Sally, and, and Sarah, what a great effort today. I really appreciate you going in the extra, you know, the extra yards that you ran, the extra effort. And I'm not animated, but I pointed them out and, and, some coaches aren't like that so and, and some coaches are totally animated and then and it's phony sometimes it's it's always fluffy and like no that wasn't a good ball you, you toe poke it out of bounds and you're you know you've got to also get that respect and credibility that the coach deserves you got to be careful with it you can't always be lame you know they, they'll they'll read you and go my coach it's just always fluffy yeah yeah, and I would, I would jump in and say the other thing. I know there's a lot of, again, research in youth development and education and how to 
extinguish behaviors you don't want and encourage behaviors that you do. Um, and the easiest and fastest way to do that is to find the things you want people to do and, and highlight that. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. yep. It's really easy to tell a player, don't kick it out of bounds, but that's not helpful to that player because that doesn't give her the information she needs for next time to avoid kicking it out of bounds. Right, right, but right. It's also about one solution oriented coaching, I think is important if you're going to give constructive feedback, like Tim said, Hey, I like that. Next time I think the more effective option is to shoot it's solution oriented. And sure. the second thing is if you do see a player executing the exact thing you want to see, Hey, I love that you stepped to press because her head was down. Um, and trying to reinforce those visual cues with that positive feedback is one of the fastest way, especially with young kids who want to please, um, in almost a hundred percent of circumstances, kids will do well if they can. Um, and so I think really focusing on things you want to see and highlighting those and reinforcing it with the visual cue, um, is a much more effective way of coaching than telling them what you don't want them to do. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Like Tony Chico said, right? Catch him being good. Yeah, I know. I know. And I listen, I totally 100% agree with that. There are times, and I want to talk to the audience, there are times when you say, Marie, you're grounded. Curfew is 11 o'clock. You're a bad girl. <laughs> there is absolutely times talking back, um, you know, rolling their eyes at you. Um, the boy, the boy um, throwing a punch at somebody. There's limits when we say, ah, uh -uh, that you passed over the boundaries, you're grounded. Exactly. It, that's why, that's why it's going back to, to the beginning, right? And saying like, Megan, sorry, no, nothing's Megan, you saw, Pablo, I got to interrupt you. I threw out a girl out of my game yesterday or two days ago. She was walking back on defense and she's did it for like three weeks now. And I'm tired of the positive BS. Jordan, remember Morgan, uh, Megan, Jordan, get out, go sit out. You want to walk, walk over to the bench. That's where you can walk. And I've asked her three times during the game, run, get back, get back. I don't have time to be positive right now. We're going to get scored on. So I think there's a time to say, uh-uh, enough's enough. I asked you politely three times. We're moving on. Yeah. It's, it's, it's never black or white, of course. It's never black or white. Sure. And I think the important thing is then afterwards doing the assessment of what was the gap, right? Like if you do get to that non-negotiable, was it an understanding problem with this particular player? Probably not. She, like having been there, right? Did she not understand that she needed to, to run? Was she not capable of running? Maybe it's a physical limitation or was it a choice to disregard the information she was being given and what she was being asked to do. So I think being sure. careful about that too, because I also see, I've seen the same thing in coaches in our environment, a player maybe isn't able to control a difficult pass and it goes straight out of bounds. And then the coach is ticked off and drags her off the field. Right. And it's like, that's not good. That, you know, one, it wasn't a, an understanding issue and it, it certainly wasn't a choice that she made to kick it straight out of bounds. Um, so I think being careful about, Having non-negotiables is important, and I think having a line in the sand, but making sure you assess why the expectation was unmet before you sort of go that route, or you know, or maybe after and reflecting on it. Yep, totally. No, I believe yeah, it's one, just one thing, yeah. yeah, one thing that uh, 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 basically we discuss with our coaches and make it clear from the beginning that we award effort. Okay, that is uh, uh, that is the only thing that we are expecting for players. Uh, mistakes are allowed. Uh, mistake, you know, in decision making, technical execution, that is something that cannot be prevented. Uh, it is how player recovers and uh, how much effort he puts in training session, game. You know, that's what is awarded. And then when that is uh, respected, uh, I don't think there is a problem with the players, and they understand. When there is lack of effort, I mean, it's a uh... compliment. We also said the same at the professional level as well. He said, I don't expect my teams or my players to be geniuses because that comes from inspiration and that's not under their control, but I expect them to give like a hundred percent because that comes from will. So that's always controllable for them. Correct. Makes sense. Anyway, um, so these are the eight elements that we that we defined in the brush blue thread. We had the the desire and the aspiration that we 
we managed to get everybody on board and to really push this through in all of our clubs and have this as a, as a thread itself that connects us all. Um, when people look at a session, it could be a session that it says skins versus shirts, but they still know that it's a rush session because these elements are present. Um, again, it's not going to be a black black and white situation. There are a lot of grays. You're playing two more, so you're doing set pieces today and, try, and, and trying to keep the intensity low, so it might be more interrupted than, than these eight principles are saying, right? But um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a common thread for all of us to start working. Pablo, one, one thing, uh, uh, what you guys are showing here is uh, basically uh, uh, application uh, on a training session. Mm -hmm. uh, watch the coach concentrate uh, uh, when he executes whatever that training session is. Uh, I think that we should also put together uh, 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 what are the elements uh, that we need to pay attention when we are preparing the session. You know, uh, I, I, I did put like 10 elements uh, uh, that we are following when we are preparing session, where it starts from, where it ends. And uh, maybe you can uh, rephrase it and uh, put it, uh -huh. because that, that should be before this. You know what I mean? Uh, those are, those are uh, elements based on which we are creating session. And then these are basically elements uh, of execution of the, of the session what we are paying attention to and how we are doing it. Would you agree to that? Yes, I mean, some, some of these, um, there, there are some that are related to the, the execution itself, even if they can be planned. Um, for instance, if there's an ongoing cycle of feedback, our reflection is more of an execution part, at least that, that would be my first thought. Then there are other things that you can always plan in advance. For example, even you, using conditions to encourage competitions, you can always plan for that. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a combination of both both elements, things that are that, that we want to see if they're happening. And that's what I would actually really encourage everybody. I have a checklist that I can share. It's very simple. And I think it would be really good for us to start assessing. It's like, hey, are my sessions actually complying with these eight principles? Check mark or not, and why? Maybe there's a good reason for not, but just start evaluating our sessions based on it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I responded to your question. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, if I read uh, these 10 things, they are very short. Uh, uh, let's say this is related to preparation of the, uh, those are the elements of check boxes, you know, that, that coaches have to go through when we are preparing a, a training session. So basically, number one is apply general learning teaching models defined by different age groups uh, for different age groups we, here in Canada it's long-term player development uh, mm -hmm. uh, make sessions simple and clear but make sure it always teaches principles elements of the game basically to be as close as possible to the game start with easy and simple and move to difficult and complex from part to whole identify and formulate purpose and goal of the training session Make session understandable for players. Players understand and all the problem to be resolved. Identify key principles, elements, and patterns in the four most important moments in the soccer game. Teach players to manage pressure using time and space. Teach players to read the game. Develop players' ability to read the game. Constantly test decision-making and vision of the game. Uh, this is tools that are Define analyzing models and tools to facilitate learning process and manage progress. Progression manuals, tests, video analysis, scouting analysis, evaluations, ID camps, provincial, regional, national ID camps, visits, and reports. Define goals and create teams for each training session based on progress analysis. Problems define sessions and problem resolution grants progress. So basically, uh, those are things that we are kind of checking when we are preparing. We have progression manual as a base, and then from there, based on how our players are progressing, we are uh, uh, preparing session that is addressing uh, whatever players are behind or what they need to improve and do we meet objective at the end at the end of the year. Uh, that is that is something that we are doing uh, uh, when we are preparing program for the for the season. I just finished it for, for, for this season for uh, U10 uh, and up. Yeah, and I think I was just going to jump in really quick. I think to your question, like what comes first, I think for us, like in thinking about coaching development and thinking about addressing a massive network, 
of coaches and, and those sorts of things. And, and the conversations that Pablo and I've had have been a lot around how do we get, how do we ensure that the experience of a rush player in Montana and Hawaii and Colorado and Virginia is similar in some way. Uh -huh. um, and mm -hmm. I think exactly. having a core set of like behaviors and, and like this, like the way that we coach and the way that we address um, the environment was our starting point. And then I think to your point about how do you actually maybe the nuts and bolts of designing the session, um, you know, I think, and I'll, I'll speak for myself. I think it's less important to me, the methodology, if it's play, practice, play, you're talking about a progressive methodology, which for some groups is great for others, maybe not starting simple, ending complex. There's lots of research pushing up against that currently in education. Um, and so I think, being prescriptive about saying it must be small sided, extended, small sided, then ending in a game, or it must be play, practice, play, whole part, whole. It, it must, like, I think we're, and I won't speak for Pablo maybe, but I think the idea is to stay away from being real prescriptive about Absolutely. the structure of the session in thinking more in terms of what are the things that we know, no matter what session structure Steven loves and Tim loves, we know that players will learn in that environment and it will recreate the demands of the game. And for us, like these were the eight kind of starting points. If these things are happening in every session, for me, I could care less if it's play, practice, play, progressive, whole part, whole, um, because I know players are going to learn in that environment. Um, I completely agree. But, but I think there will be material coming that's maybe a little bit more prescriptive about here are the, the 10 checklist items before you – execute the session to really go through and make sure you have a clear objective. Like you said, identified principles, identified visual cues. Um, you've thought about how you're going to prepare players and how you're going to reflect at the end. Um, so I think those things are coming. I think some of it's like an ongoing project. And this was sort of the thing that we said, if we could get every coach in rush doing these eight things. We've already done an incredible step forward. We'd be miles ahead of, you know, any other club maybe in the world. Exactly. Hey, exactly. I got to go, Pablo. I got a call starting in like 30 seconds. Absolutely. You, thank, thank you for jumping in. Eh? Absolutely. Goodbye. Goodbye. So, no, no, I I fully agree with that. We, we, we give even even in the developmental blueprint, we give recommendations, but we try to stay pretty, pretty far away from being prescriptive. Because there's also something else that, in, and again, I'm not really talking from science or books at this point, but something that I just noticed by observation in my in my career and in my life is um it depends so much on the individual that there are there are people that are great at, are, at doing it one way or another um that i've seen people that have very little structure in their sessions they're just really good at managing the flows are, um and it wouldn't really fit under any any specific format um of course that doesn't mean that it everything should be random not at all but but yeah, it's very hard to be prescriptive. So we're trying to just stay pretty far away from it. Yeah, Pablo, I wouldn't call this being prescriptive. You know, uh, we need to have guidelines. You know, if we consider this to be guideline, you know, something that is going to provide you with a framework and right in which uh, exactly. giving you, yeah, and then everybody will have freedom in their own environment, depending on culture and everything else to adjust it and modify it and do it. But it will give us some kind of... Uh, frame you know that is going to keep us as one organization right and, and, and I, I i'm looking at this as a guideline i'm not looking at this as something that is uh, uh, like bible you know that everybody has to call to but it's good guideline and then it can be connected to progression manuals and everything else and nothing is written in a stone am i right as we are learning uh, about uh, uh, how how kids are learning uh, about their mental mental uh, 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 complexity and things like that, you know, on psychological area, lots of stuff changed in my lifetime. You know, I'm I'm probably old, but lots of that changed. You know, the way people are uh, learning, teaching, uh, you know, relationship change, everything changed. And this is going to change in the years, but we have to start somewhere. And I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And I wouldn't be too much uh, sensitive to, uh, you know, or afraid that it's going to be some kind of uh, uh, 
prescription or whatever. I would say it's a guideline, you know. And it is, uh, it is, it is. No, but completely, you're, you're getting, you're, you're completely right. You're getting the the right spirit out of it. That that's what we want to do. We want to present the correct. framework. It doesn't mean that it's that everything's set in stone, of course. And I think this is great thing, you know. And I just wouldn't uh, uh, like you guys to be limited or discouraged uh, by you know whatever you may or somebody else may think this can look like. You know, mm -hmm. it is, it is, it is good to have starting point. Exactly. Completely, no, completely. Like, like the, that's exactly the the, the spirit that, that we're trying to have through it. Super, it's to present a framework, not to say that anything is black or white or that it has to be like this rigorously. No. That would be, you can't separate things from their context. So um, it's it's guidance. And and remember, anyway. guys, we have lots of young coaches that are learning. You know, for them, it's going to be, I would say, the 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 uh, uh, the, the first book on on soccer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Is we have exactly. coaches coming from from our players. You know that are going to our internal uh, coaches development program and then you know to to uh, uh, licensing program at uh, at uh, regional level uh, provincial level but this will be their handbook and right and that's exactly. how i look at it you know in the no it is it is it is it is in fact in, in all of these documents that you're that, that i'm releasing that that was exactly the idea to have a handbook because the rush way is very very comprehensive but how can you how can you turn it into a handbook that takes you five, four or five steps from our club philosophies to to the way that we want to see training sessions from why i think guys this is much better and more important for coaches development than any uh, 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 i would say regional program national program because this is what they uh, uh, work based on if this is our handbook am i right and they are working with their teams and their technical director is basically uh, uh, helping them out to apply that program, then it's hands-on and it's much more instrumental in their development than some program that they go to one week or two weeks or you know uh, do some remote uh, studying. Here they're hands-on, they're actually training teams and they're seeing uh, uh, impact or effect of, uh, of what they're doing. So they can self-reflect them, right, it, it, on daily basis, not uh, not uh, from time to time. So that's what I'm saying. For me, this is extremely important, and it will help us out here to create an excellent uh, uh, starting point uh, that is uh, uh, our culture, our club-based uh, coaches development uh, development uh, program. Absolutely, I, I appreciate that, and I and. I fully agree with you. That's why, to me, this this part was instrumental. It was the most important part. Anyway, um, it's it's been a, a long talk. I, I, I do want to give space for anybody else if anybody had any questions or wanted to make any comments. This is just a conversation. Um, but I really appreciate everybody's time, and um, I've learned a lot. So I, I really I'm really happy that that we took the the time and the space for this. Um, so thank you. And um, if anybody wants to wrap it up, say anything else, please go ahead. If not, um, thank you very much for again for this. We're definitely recording it. We're going to edit it and we're going to post it. Just to say, Pablo, that your effort and your team's effort is appreciated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lola. And thank you, everybody. All right, gentlemen, may I have to step out as well? She sent a message saying thank you very much. Um, you, you guys, reach out to us directly for anything that you need. Um, we we, we want to get closer to you. We want to try to help you with your specific needs in your club. So we're here to help. So thanks, everybody. And um, I'll see you soon. Take care.